we call it grace. When we come to Jesus Christ, it's His grace that saves us, but it's even His grace that gives us the faith that we need to believe. May you praise this God of grace this morning. Good morning. Welcome to CCF. How are you guys doing? Good. You ready to worship God? Amen. Ready to give Him glory? Amen. Give Him praise? Yes. Yeah, thank you to the band for doing such a great job of helping us sing, getting to the rhythm. What's that? Such great songs, counting every blessing. You know, our pastor was uh, talking last week, uh, making some connections, Old Testament, New Testament. And so I want to read something from the Old Testament that kind of goes back and reminds us. You can't really have the perspective that this God doesn't love us and have mercy and give grace to us. As we read Micah 6, 6 through 8, we can see even back then, back at the beginning, God was worried with uh, mercy and not sacrifice. All those things came into place for those who have to be reconciled to him. But we can read in Micah 6, 8 that it's been there from the beginning. Just like Jesus says, love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, we see it back at the same time. Jesus himself even quoted 
uh, go and see what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And he's referring back to Micah. So let me read this to us this morning, and then I'll pray for us. Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm reading from a Jewish version. So Adonai is going to be said. That just means the Lord. So for those of us who have forgotten that. With what can I come before Adonai to bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves in their first year? Would Adonai take delight in thousands of rams, with ten thousands rivers of oil, of olive oil? Could I give my firstborn to pay for my crimes, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Human being, you have already been told what is good and what Adonai demands of you. No more than to act justly, to love grace, and to walk in purity with your God. So we see even back in the day, back way back in the day, God's always had a heart and instructions for us. We see it in the life and New Testament of his son, but we see it back then. God doesn't want sacrifices. That's not the way it goes. He wants us to walk right, to be humble, to love mercy, to be just. And nothing else does he desire from us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have never changed. No matter what others have said, what other perspectives have been made of you, Father, you have never changed, and we can see it clearly when we compare the words of your prophets from the Old Testament, Lord, the way they behaved, and we all see it through the lives of the New Testament in your Son, perfecting it, Lord, that it became more clear for us. Thank you, Father, that you do not require for us more than these three simple things, Lord, because we all have access to it, and we can do it with your help, with your Spirit, and with the spirit of your son, Father. Thank you that you know how we are, Lord. You know we are dust and you've been merciful and gracious to us, Lord. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice, doing what we could not do to make us right for the sins that we've committed as, a, as, as human beings. We bless you, Lord. Help us to bless you with our words. Help us to remember that you are the same God and you never change, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your mercy and just love you this morning. We lift up our voices to praise you and your son. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jason. Please stand again with us.
love those instrumentals in some of our worship songs because instruments sometimes say the things that we can't and it's a beautiful melody that we give up to the Lord
Trusting God is easy when life is easy. When life gets hard, uh, we have a hard time with trusting God. But that's when we need to trust God. When life gets tough, but it starts with trusting God all the time. Trusting that he's good and that he's loving. Trusting that God knows what you don't and that sometimes the difficult things in life, God is allowing because that's the only way through. So it all comes down to that. Can we trust God? Let's learn to trust him as we grow in this journey to heaven. Trust God. He loves you and he knows you better than you know yourself.
trust in That's why I trust in God My Savior Who will never fail Who will never fail I trust in God My Savior Most of us, most of the world has their eyes on, on Israel, but before I get there, the story of God by, from the rooted uh, care groups we're going to be having, I can't encourage you enough to be part of that because none of you are smart enough. You need to keep growing in smarts until you die. I'm not smart enough. You're not smart enough. So we want to get good Bible in our, in our souls. And it's a way to do that. And it's a way where you can talk about it. Here you learn a small percentage of what I say to you. And then you go in your head, you go into tangents. You're playing with what I said or what God said to you and you, got, and you miss half the sermon. And How many of you remember what I taught last week? No, you don't. You're, not, you're, not, you're lying to me. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm going to call on you, because uh, I tell you why, when it comes time for me to do this week's sermon, I go, go, what did I teach last week? I look at my notes, and I go, okay, <laughs> let alone those who hear it. What I'm saying is that the best learning comes when you interact, when you're talking back with that, and when you're able to interact with the Word of God. Now, I hope that you're interacting with the Lord as he gives me a word to give to you, and I believe it's essential for us as a body to be together corporately like this weekly. I think it's a biblical, God-given mandate for us. But the greatest learning happens when you're together in these care groups. Uh, the Rooted uh, series of various discipleship programs came out of the Mariner's Church in, uh, in South Orange County, and, and I really like Kenton Bishur and the group that was there. I think he's retired now, but it, it's an international kind of group that came together with this information. I think it's really good for you. I think you really enjoy it. So I can't encourage you enough to sign up for that. Uh, also, the National Day of Prayer is coming. We have a couple uh, tables. One table is already for the band because we're actually the featured worship band for the National Day of Prayer. Yeah. I don't know how that happens, but somebody's given somebody money under the table somewhere. <laughs> so anyway, so we've been asked again to do that. So that's May 2nd, I believe. And I think there's another table, but we have to make sure, we don't, not exactly sure how many seats are left, because some people pre-want to get those seats. But it's an early morning breakfast. There's a guest speaker in worship, and then prayer for our whole, you know, Southern California Inland Empire area. So that's something coming up. Whether you attend that or not, May 2nd is the National Day of Prayer. We would invite you to make that a day of specific prayer, even though I know that all of you are praying on your knees every day for hours. Yeah. Yeah. Don't say yes, because we'll check your knees. <laughs> we'll have a knee inspection. <laughs> Who's praying? Let's see. Lift up your pants. That's right. Okay. Um, everybody has their eyes on Israel. Oh, one more thing. Georgia Moore, uh, if you don't mind me saying. Uh, Georgia's uh, husband, Jim, passed away this week. And, uh, you know, we know Jim from uh, the camping that he did with us. And for some of us, got to know him a little bit better in different ways. But uh, uh, 
he's gone to be with the Lord, and so uh, just keep uh, Georgia in your prayers as a... Uh, he, at least to me, was unexpected. I knew he was ill, but I didn't, we didn't expect him to pass away. He was in the process of recovering from something. But anyway, that said, God has plans we don't know. So uh, keep Georgia in your prayers. Uh, oh, another thing. <laughs> I officially retired from my chaplaincy this week. Yeah. Uh, I've been waiting. I, I've been ready to do that for some time. I've been a chaplain for over 28 years with Ontario Police Department, and uh, so I had a little discussion with them, and, um, and so I was happy to say, it's, you've got your pound of flesh out of me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop now, and so they're able to go on without me, so that's a good thing. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. Oh, Barbara's son is one of our uh, wonderful police officers there. Okay, most of the world has their eyes on Israel. Uh, they are being uh, attacked. Uh, they have in various ways for many years in the Middle East. There are enemies all about them. In the Bible, it tells us with clarity that the end times will be uh, partly known or certainly uh, will be sensitive to the fact that the end times are coming when there are wars and rumors of wars. But I think that's specifically pointing to not the world, but to uh, Israel. And so as they all the more uh, are being that country that has, uh, for whatever reason, this little country... uh, has a target on its back by every other Middle Eastern country. And so we watch Israel and its effect in the world to kind of get a sense of where are we in end time events. And of course, the clock started ticking, in my opinion, when Israel became a nation. Because they weren't a nation for a long time. So to talk about Israel as a nation and wars and rumors of wars didn't make sense until it became a nation after World War II. So now, as the drum is rolling to the end times, we see more and more Israel being the focus of world events. Now, some are saying, is this a sign of the end times? I don't know. I, I, don't, I think the wars and rumors of wars is the time of end times. The biggest sign to me, if I can say to you, we can read out of Ezekiel uh, 37 and 38, and we can read about end times. And, and the Bible's full of things regarding end times. But that there would be a contingency of countries that come against Israel that would all the more make it, ah, this is more towards the end times. And that's more uh, concerning to me, or at least uh, more awakening to my soul than anything. Because since Israel has become a nation, people have chosen to hate Israel. Another sidebar to that is this, is that uh, for whatever reason... Uh, The Muslim community in general, not every Muslim, there's good Muslims, just like there's bad Christians. Uh, There are good Muslims out there, uh, decent Muslims. But it's hard to find a Muslim that doesn't want Israel to exist. Uh, As Muslim countries, uh, they, they, and I'm speaking, there's exceptions to every rule, but in general, They despise Israel. And they want the demise of Israel. They don't believe that Israel has the right to exist. And that's why you can't find uh, any kind of like common ground. Because you have to start with at least saying you have a right to exist. But that is common in the highest tables of negotiation that that will not be accepted by the current Muslim countries. Israel does not have a right to exist. And it's hard to find a middle ground when that's the stance you take. And there's a lot of background to that. I'm not, I'm not speaking, you know, you know, doomsday, you know, articles. These are things that are well documented by politicians and others, etc. So that's just the stance. But 
what's happening in Europe is that currently, right now, I think there's 6,000 6, mosques being built in Europe right now. As 6,000 mosques are being currently erected or built in Europe, churches are leaving and declining. There is now a population switch in that it won't be too long before the Muslim community, and I'm talking about religious um, doctrine, is gonna over, will overtake Europe. I've read there's no turning back. It's too late. They're already past the numbers because of the amount of kids they have and the amount of kids the Europeans don't have. That there's going to be a switch. So all the more, as the world becomes more and more anti-Israel, that becomes more like what I watch. More than the fact that Israel is in a particular war right now. Also, uh, there is an alliance of certain countries that the Bible speaks about it in times that when they come together, that's when you've got to go, okay, this is really end time event stuff. And so as those countries come together, uh, that's more alarming. I don't know. If, I don't know if the word alarming is is the right word, but it's more eye opening to end times. We know now, and I heard on uh, st- stations I generally don't watch or trust or like, uh, frankly, but uh, CNN this morning, MSNBC, CBS, etc., uh, as they were stating that the alliance between Russia. Iran and China is clear and that their alliances are partly uh, what's happening to Israel because they're subsidizing uh, the creation of the war machine uh, and, and much of the the missiles and drones that are attacking Ukraine are are being purchased from Iran as they manufacture them from Russia And so those connections we can find in the Bible, those countries. So those things are the ones that make me a little bit more awake to the fact that we're moving towards an end time kind of scenario. The message isn't on that this morning. I just want you to understand that God has a timeline. I don't know what it is. The Bible says that nobody does but we're called to follow him and to love him and do, as we try to sing this morning, trust him, to give your life to him. And that you would do so by faith in what the Bible has told us. There are many proofs to the authenticity of the scriptures more than any other literature in the world. Do we have literature from close to the first century like we have no other writings from any other kind of literature. Now, if you have any other material that I don't, let me know. But again, this is things you can read that aren't, again, something that's fly-by-night. These are, you know, documented manuscripts. I've seen them in Israel. I've been there, and I've... I have a master's in Christian studies. I've studied them. I've seen them. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, etc., etc., and many uh, things that we find that make us very um, uh, confident in the sources we have that give us what we have, the story of God. And the story of God is that He created a people because He loves us. And he loves us and wanted to be in relationship with us, but sin and rebellion has entered the human race because we have an enemy. And we believe the enemy rather than God, and so there's been a fall. And so we're all born with that infection of what we call sin. It's the self-centered DNA, the thing that says, I'm king, I, I'm God. It's just that human being yelling, I'm God. That's the sin of all of us. And... And it's only in that we come to Jesus that something happens inside of us that awakens us to this fact, I'm not God and I'm going to (laughs) die. And the only way out of this condition is the one 
who mastered, overcame death, Jesus. The one who was greater than death. The one who had victory over death. death. The one who said that if you trust me and believe in me, in me you will have everlasting life. That's Jesus. And Jesus said he's the only way out. There is no other way. So you may think that Jesus is a good guy, a good prophet, blah, blah, blah. He's a good guy, but he's not the son of God. You'd have to say he's a liar too then if you don't believe Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. Call me a bigot. Call me whatever you want. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says there's one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ, the Son, who he sent. Now, we come to faith by the grace of God. What is the grace of God? The grace of God is his gift of love and care for us. That is not all wrapped up in gooey feelings but in real choice for you, in real choice for me. We tend to speak of the word love and think gooeyness. And there is a place for that kind of love. I've been married for 50 years, and I love that place. But it's not the only kind of love that the Bible speaks about. And the gracious love that saves us is a love that's beyond that. It's a love that's a gift love, a choosing love, to want you and to care for you and to save you. Let's start with that. Now let's talk about this. When Jesus rose from the dead, he had made promises that he was going to raise from the dead. So they were all up in arms. Let's not let this happen because should they steal the body and he's not there, they're going to have, we're going to have a bigger, these are the, the Jewish leaders talking among themselves we'll have a greater problem than the first time that jesus came so he he asked really those in charge the romans please guard it do something don't let anybody take the body well you know the story but another promise that jesus had made was this that another one is going to come after me once i leave and only because i'm going to leave is another one like me going to come? It's going to be the person of the Holy Spirit. And when He comes, He will guide you. He will counsel you. He will be with you, and He will be in you. The Holy Spirit. We're going to look at, a little bit at our relationship to the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says that in these end times, we have a power to live the Christian life. And that power comes from the indwelling Spirit of God in us. That has met up and made our spirit, small s, alive to God, the big S. So the Spirit in us, the human spirit is dead to God because of sin, becomes alive to God because of the Holy Spirit, and now we're spiritual beings, not just flesh beings. And we're alive to God. So here's what it tells us in 2 Corinthians. There'll be a lot of reading here, but it won't be boring, I don't think, because it's also pertinent to what we have to hear this morning. In 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 6, Paul is saying, we are ministers of a new covenant, a new contract that we're under. That we're under this, this new relationship with God because of Jesus. Because in the Old Testament, as was mentioned, there was a form and forms by which we got to know who God was and who we were. There were forms of legality. They were all kinds of rules and laws and sacrifices that we might know that God is holy, that God is awesome, that God is just, that God is 
powerful, and that God is love, and that God wants you to trust Him and to follow Him. And that, and that when we don't, there are dire consequences. I've told you this story before. I'll say it briefly to you. Many, many, many years ago, it might have been even before I had kids, we lived at 730 East 8th Street in Ontario. I say that address because there's people here who are very familiar with 8th Street. And one day, as I was driving west, I passed campus to Sultana. As I sat there in the car, waiting for the car to pass, because we had to stop and they did not, a little boy between two cars ran out. And I see it, I saw it like in slow motion as the car coming hit him. And he flew across the intersection like, like a bent body like this, almost like a cartoon. And I saw him come to rest as I was running out of my car and running to him. It happened that others were there too and saw that. That little boy survived and for many, many months in the corner house, he was on the porch in a full body cast. And he lived. So yay, he lived. But here's what it did to me. I couldn't wait for my son to go out into the street for the first time. Because I was going to spank him so hard he would never, ever go again. Because the consequence of running out in the street without realizing that there's a consequence to it will kill him or put him in a full body cast for months. And the day came. I was waiting for it. I was looking for poor Luke. Until finally one day he stepped off the curve without my okay. And boy, did he get it. He may not remember it. Yeah. <laughs> Go and show him, son. <laughs> What's my point? Is that the consequence of disobedience, the consequence of doing something that could kill you, meant that I had to be hard on him so he would know that there are consequences to disobeying me when I say, Stop! There's a reason why I yell, Stop! No! Stop! Because when you keep going, something bad's going to happen. Now, that's just a little example of the fact that when God in the Old Testament reveals His justice and His hard hand against sin, He's trying to save humanity. Because if we go on sinning without His intervention, you will die. So praise God that we have a God who's ready to give you a hand in the backside as soon as you jump off the curb that's going to kill you. You name your sin, they're all kinds. That when you jump off and enter into those sins, they'll take you on as though they're going to give you something good and they're going to kill you. And so God, God's hands of, of justice is there and God's hands of mercy is there. And only by His grace are we saved as the Old Testament unfolds who God is and who we are. We have a head and we have a heart to rebellion. The Jewish people were never a people. They were, they were nomads and then God called Abraham out of a place to follow Him, to trust Him and come with me to this city and we're going to start a new, a, new, a new group of people. He didn't pick Abraham because he was anything in particularly special. We eventually find that he believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Or he was reckoned to be right before God because he trusted God. So God wants to bring us all to a place where we learn to trust God. And for those who believe in God and trust him, we call that faith will be children of Abraham. We'll be part of that contingency of people that God calls out of the world to be saved. 
2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 6 says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as some others, letters of recommendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. For you are prominently declared to be the letter of Christ, prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on human tablets of the heart. Paul is responding to the fact that people are going, who are these guys? Who are these cats? They're putting them down all the time. And Paul says, you're our letter. Your lives testify to the reality of Jesus. And you're, you're living letters of a living God. All of you here, most of you anyway, have, con, have come through or gone through something that God through that brought you to himself and made you a new person. And because you became a new person in Jesus, those who knew you before went like this, uh, what happened to you? Something's different about you. Something's uniquely different. What's wrong with you? Why don't you want to do this anymore or do that anymore? Because I trust Jesus now. I'm now following Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. Oh man, are you a Jesus thumper, man? Are you a Jesus freak? That's what they used to call us. Jesus freaks, and we always had to come back with that. Now, he makes, he makes people out of freaks. But that was the big deal. Something's different in us. And it's not just because we go to church now, or it's important to us, that that becomes true. But something's different in who we are. We're different. We're not the same anymore. Something's changed. Y'all think Joe Dingman's a good guy. You should have known him before. It's like, oh my gosh. He was stealing golf balls from Red Hill Country Club back in the day. We become new people. And some of us you didn't see beforehand. And we're, we're grateful for that. <laughs> I think uh, after I, uh, I, I've said this many times to you too, but I had a, uh, you know, a, a sordid life when I wasn't a believer like all of you, I think. Uh, but uh, in 1994, I had an album that had come out, a Christian record. Back, we called them records back then. <laughs> who, who knows what a record is? Okay, I had an album that came out back then. And so that took uh, you know, a lot of press. That was, it was on the, the, the front page of the Daily Bulletin, cause, not because I knew anybody there. And, and there were things that happened, and, and it was a big who to do in our area. And then we had this event where we were going to play the music, and there in the crowd are girls I went to high school with. And I'm going, oh, God. I wanted to stop, get off, and get on my knees and apologize of being such a jerk in their lives. Uh, and, and, you know, and you don't know, well, some of you do know, how you feel when you're a new person, but you see somebody who doesn't know you're a new person, and you just want to shrink. Because all of a sudden, what you were before, you became alive to that you never saw before. I didn't know I was such an idiot. I just thought I was a cool guy then. I looked back and I'm going, oh God, and you cringe as to who you were and now who God is making you. And that's what happens. And then God brings people alongside of you and help develop you and help you through rooted programs. And, and sermons and, and songs and fellowship and, and we change and we become more like Jesus and then you become the ink of God. You become a letter that testifies to the fact that Jesus lives. That's what Paul is saying here. You're our letter to the Corinthians. Here's what it says in the message. You yourselves are all the endorsement we need. Your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it, not with ink, but with God's living spirit. 
not chiseled into stone, but carved into human lives. Because originally, the law of God, and we needed it, was written on tablets. Let's just look at the Ten Commandments. Why were they, give, why were they given? Because really the Bible in the New Testament speaks of them as being letters of death. The Ten Commandments were, were like a death sentence. Why? Because it revealed the standard that I needed to get to heaven. And what did it tell me? I couldn't keep them. And then Jesus clarified it. He went on to say like this, Oh, you think that you haven't committed adultery? When you lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. And then we go, Oh, I thought I was safe. I'm not. Oh, I've kept them all. And then, and then we read the last commandment. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not want something you shouldn't really want. <laughs> you know what? Life is good until my wife starts seeing those HGTV shows and they show houses. <laughs> I was satisfied. And then she causes me to sin. I look at that house. She goes, look at that house, honey. Yeah, I want that, honey. We want a new car. We start looking at cars. All of a sudden, we go, oh, now we're dissatisfied. I want that car in that color because I would look good in that car. I would be something. I would be special then. That's crazy how we think, but the fact of the matter is is that we change and God brings us to himself and, 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 and we find out that, that what was in stone only condemned us. The Ten Commandments condemned us, but they were also a teacher pointing us to the perfect one who could keep it, which, which was Jesus. And that's what the New Testament tells us. It says that the Old Testament, and, and in particular, the letter of the law, was a tutor training us and teaching us about who God was, who we are, and our need for Jesus. And it pointed us to Jesus. Because ultimately, God doesn't want to write the Ten Commandments on some tablet to hit you over the head with it because you couldn't keep it. But He wants to write His life on your heart. And He comes into your life and that happens. Then we're not saved by our ability to keep or not keep the Ten Commandments, but by Jesus, the perfect one who did. And we trust God for that. And if we trust God, we are children of Abraham. Because we're accepted or made right by God because we trust Him, not because we can keep the dance He's asked us to dance. Are you following me? We, Paul goes on to say that, that he's written uh, on our hearts uh, the tablets on human hearts. And then in verse 4, we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to take credit for anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us able ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. They're bringing the Spirit of God so people can have the Spirit of God enter into them. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 10. Therefore, since we have this ministry through the mercy we have received, we do not lose heart. What is mercy? Mercy. Go ahead. Not getting what you deserve. That's mercy. A good way of looking at that. Mercy is what? Not Not getting what we deserve. I always feel bad when somebody gives me something nice. They go, oh, you deserve it. I just feel, oh. (laughs) No, I don't. (laughs) Mercy. But I thank you for your mercy. When I get a gift, I go, thank you for your mercy towards me and your favor towards me. I don't earn it, I don't deserve it, but you choose it, and I'm, and I'm even more grateful. Therefore, since we have this ministry through mercy we have received, we do not lose heart. 
But we have renounced the secret things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by expressing the truth and commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel is hidden, what's gospel? The good news of Jesus Christ. But if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are lost. The God of this world, who? Yeah, Satan, the devil, demons. We have an enemy. The Bible is very clear that he is real. The God of this world, that's who that is depicting, our enemy, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, comes and takes that over. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay, this gets a little bit, you know, I could spend a lot of time here, but I want to move to a point. But it talks about the glory of God. What is the glory of God? The beauty, the importance, the value of God. The beauty. That's, that's the glory of God. When it shines, when it's revealed. The importance of God when it's revealed is the glory of God. When the value of God is revealed, it is the glory of God. So the Bible tells us that the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's an earthen vessel? Go ahead. Yeah, us. But what's the metaphor? An earthen, what's the, do you have any earthen vessels in your house? Clay. Yeah, they're clay pots. You put a plant in it. Bunk. So it's, make, it's, telling, it's saying that that's who you are. Excuse me here. It's saying that that's who you are. You're like an earthen pot. You're made of the dirt. We're all made of the dirt. You're an earthen vessel, but you have a treasure inside of you. Here's what it says. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The excellency of the power being from God and not from ourselves. There's that word power. There's a power inside of us that isn't from the earthen vessel. But what's inside or what's filled this earthen vessel. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And always carrying around in the body the death of the Lord Jesus, that also the life of Jesus might be expressed in our bodies. Something happens to the human when they accept Jesus. There is a new way of thinking, a new way of looking, that whenever something comes our way that is, that is disturbing, that is difficult, that we're not going to be waylaid by it. Because we have this treasure that's inside of us. The power of God that's in us. Here's what John 16, 14 says. He will glorify me, this is Jesus speaking, for he will receive me, for, for, I'm sorry, for he will receive from me and will declare to you. What's that mean? He's going to declare to you what? The glory of Jesus, the glory of God, the beauty and the importance and the value of God. Here's what the Bible says. The Spirit is meant in all that He does to make Jesus look magnificent. That's what He's in the world to do. So if you love the beauty of Christ, if you treasure the glory of Christ, you are going to love the ministry of the Holy Spirit because that's what he's here to do, to glorify 
the Son. The Son is glorified in being seen for who He really is and being responded to with affection that's appropriate to the glory that He is. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit in us to be moved to Christ. Do you know that it's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit? Can you imagine that? Making or grieving God? The Bible says you can grieve God. We can grieve God, it tells us in Ephesians 4, when we don't live right regarding others. It says, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. There's many ways we can sin by anger being that emotion that moves us towards things that are destructive. But here's what it says. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give place to the devil. Let him who steals steal no more. Instead, let him labor, working with his hands things which are good, that he may have something to share with him who is in need. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. Oops. Anybody fail at that this morning yet? It's okay, you still have time. (laughs) But But say only that which is good for building up, that it may give grace to the listener. And do not... Grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. So the Bible is telling us that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us and His very indwelling of you has sealed, wrapped you for heaven. And nobody can unseal that. But when we don't live up to it, we bring grief to our Father. That's why it goes on to say this. So let all bitterness and wrath and anger and outbursts and blasphemies and malice, let that be taken away from you. But instead, be kind to one another. Every year I go, I'm going to be kinder this year. I go, oh gosh, I can fail at that. That little thing. Be kinder. But be kind to one another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as, God, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's because the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Now, here's the deal if you trust God, that He's inside of you, and you read His Word, and you trust His Word, then you will, in fact, show the glory of God. The glory of God will be revealed in you when you trust God and obey His Word. When we look at end time events or the possibility of end time events, our job is to learn to trust God all the more. Not to be afraid. Not to try to make some kind of timetable unless you're gifted at that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, nobody knows the time. But as we look at those things and we we get a little bit like excited that the end times are coming someday, Our job is to trust God every day for Him being in our lives and living a life that is revealing that we belong to God by the way that we treat others. Have you noticed here that it's important that God reveals Himself through our bodies? Who would think that our body was important to God, but it is. For whatever reason, our bodies are important to God. It just I just read it a while ago to you. I just skipped over it a little bit. But it just says that our bodies are important to God. That's why we're not going to get some kind of like, you know, um, some, some weird thing after we, we go to heaven. We're going to get our bodies restored. We're going to be resurrected with restored bodies, our bodies. That's important to God. Ask me why. I don't know. I have no idea. No idea. I know this though, that God revealed that the body was important because he rose Jesus' body from the dead. 
And he said, and because of this, yours too will rise one day. God loves you. And fully he's made you human. When you die, just to remind you, you won't become an angel. Should I die before you? Don't go, oh, now he's an angel in heaven. No. He's Larry in heaven. Angels are angels, created to be angels. Humans are humans, created to be humans. And you will always have a body, but one day, a perfected, a glorified body. Because for whatever reason, bodies are important to God. Don't think I'm saying the more body you have, the more happy he is with you. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I sound like Popeye. <laughs> By the grace of God, I am what I am. Remember that? That's for those older folk. (laughs) But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than all of them. And yet I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Here's what he's saying. That there's this weird thing that happens to us as Christians. The Holy Spirit comes inside of us and and we come to Jesus because he's drawn us to himself outside of me. In other words, I've come to Jesus by faith, but even the faith I have, he's given me. And so I come to Jesus by faith. And the power I'm going to have in this life is trusting God for what he said and what he's doing in me. And as I trust him, the power of God will be revealed in my life. When I trust him, I step out in faith. I step out in real life. And as I step out in real life and I trust him, his power will be revealed. You can't go, the power of God is being revealed and do nothing. You must step out and do something. And that's the mystery. He says, I am what I am. The grace of God is in me, but I'm going to work harder than anybody else. There's this kind of dual thing. I'm going to work my buns off, but it's the power of God in me that is revealed. It's the power of God that works, but I have a part in giving myself to trusting that God and doing what I need to do. That's what Paul is saying here. May we all learn to act out what it means to be a believer, to walk by faith in Jesus, by trusting him. It's what it says in John 14, 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father, this is before he went to the cross, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit, capital S, of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. If you've not received Christ as your Savior, you're going like this, eh. But when Christ comes inside of you, something happens. When you begin to trust God, sometimes you feel it, sometimes you don't. But something happens inside your heart, something happens inside your mind, and you become a different person. And the Holy Spirit is working in your life, something different. And as you work out by faith your life, the power of God will be revealed. And when the power of God is revealed in your life, then God is glorified. His beauty and His worth will be seen. Got that? When you act out in faith and in trust, the power of God will be revealed. And as the power of God is revealed revealed in what you do or say, the glory of God will be shown. May you be those who seek to glorify God through your life because you're learning to love Him and trust Him. You're only saved by faith through grace, or rather, by grace through faith. And that never changes. You'll never find acceptance any other way. But the glory of God will be revealed. 
when you act out in trust. May we learn to do that as the Holy Spirit indwells us. Please rise. In my weakness Would you come Help me stand up Help me run To the shadow Of your wings And the comfort Thank you.